And of course, if you have questions, you can post them on Slack or in the chat. Yes, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, thanks, Rainer. Uh, and thanks, uh, Chen and everyone for organizing this. Um, right, so today's session is going to be on um, Bayesian analysis, sort of uh, the introductions behind this, a little bit of the theory, um, um, just to get you all set up. Um, and so I, my name is Simon, uh, and I'm an assistant professor uh, in statistics at Duke, um, and I'm going to be doing the first part of the lecture. Uh, and then Irene is going to take over, uh, she's my student, uh, and she's also going to do this one. Okay, and a quick um, uh, reminder before I start up the session is, um, do make sure to join the Slack channel. Uh, it's labeled this. Uh, hopefully you all can see the screen. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, um, and even just discussion, right? Uh, we have TAs on, you know, the Slack. We have uh, TAs on Zoom, um, you know, to to answer any questions that you may have, um, and to, you know, um, yeah. Uh, so so do feel free to sort of uh, engage in conversation there. Okay. Um, and of course, if you have any questions during the lecture itself, I will stop at you know periodically. Uh, uh, you know, after a couple of slides, and you can feel to sort of uh, ask your questions there as well. All right. Uh, so let me full screen this. Um, and hopefully everything is still visible. Let's get started. All right. So the first part that we're going to talk about is this more, you know, this more general paradigm about, you know, uh, 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 Bayesian inference in the context of statistical learning. Okay, so uh, we're going to first describe a little bit on you know some of the tools that we use, uh, this fundamental theorem called Bayes' rule, um, and uh, then talk a little bit about you know some of the the tools that we use specifically for Bayesian inference. Okay, uh, and then Irene's going to take over uh, after section two, um, and talk a little bit about you know more uh, specifics on emulators on PCA and how this all ties in together in a hands-on session. All right, so that's the plan today. Okay. All right, so the four problem, the inverse problem, we're gonna first talk about that and then talk a little bit about Bayes will sort of um, ties in you know, both of these problems together. All right, uh, so what is the forward problem? Um, so as, as his name suggests, right, um, we're sort of going forward in the form of uh, model parameters, to models to outputs. Okay, so of course, in all of this, we would need a certain model, a certain theoretical model, a physical model, which describes uh, the certain relevant processes that we're interested in exploring. Okay, and in Jetscape, right, we uh, deal with a wide range of uh, models involving a heavy ion collisions. Okay, and of course, these models have to start off somewhere. So we have to start off with some sort of parametrization of the model, right? Which we call uh, model inputs. Okay, and this can be in the form of uh, you know bulk viscosity, um, shear viscosity, a lot of different types of uh, physical parameters, right? That we input into uh, the physical model, right? And then we take it through the model, and then we would get uh, certain outputs or observables. Okay? These are outputs which are generated from the physical model. And keep in mind in this case, we're not only dealing with like one input or two or one output or two outputs, right? We can be dealing with a lot of different observables that we have to sort of um, um we have to sort of uh, uh, match from the data, the experiments. Okay. So that's really what the four problem is about. We start off with model parameters going through the model. Um and given a, a, a certain set of model parameters, right? What are the model outputs that we get? Of course, you know, the problem of interest oftentimes is actually the other way around. We call it the inverse problem. Okay. And in this particular case, we still start off with the model, right? We need a certain sort of a, a description of the physical, uh, relevant physical processes. And of course, we're still going to have, you know, a certain parameterization of this model. Okay. Um, but in, in, in the case of the inverse problem, we're going to start off with the outputs first or the observables. And these are typically things that we would um, collect using actual uh, actual experimentations. Right? So in Jetscape, we get a lot of our data uh, from actual heavy ion collisions from CERN, uh, 
from uh, from Rick, right? Um, and we would have to sort of use these outputs that we uh, uh, that are generated from the experiments going backwards in terms of the models to infer what type of model parameters uh, will be likely, right? Given the observables that we have. So that's really the inverse problem in a nutshell, right? Given a set of uh, model outputs or, 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 or observables, right? How do we generate uh, sort of like a probabilistic view, right? What we call the posterior of what the model parameters might look like, okay? Given that data working backwards, okay? Any questions on that so far? And again, feel free to sort of uh, interject with questions on Slack um, or on Zoom or... Okay. All right, so one issue to do with this sort of inverse problem, however, is something that we have to take into account is that these observables, especially when we observe them from uh, actual experiments uh, are oftentimes corrupted by noise. Okay. And there could be multiple sources of this noise, including experimental error, uh, measurement error, all of that stuff, right? Um, but the idea is that, well, given this noise, we then have to start off with this sort of sampling distribution. We have to posit a distribution, right, for how this, uh, um, this sort of noise comes about from the outputs. And then we have to go backwards. Right, and we have to infer right what we call later on a posterior distribution, right, on what the parameters are likely to to look like. Right, so in this case, we're, our goal is to get a certain probability distribution on the model parameters, which captures right our 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 belief on what the parameters would be, right, after we observe data. Okay. So the goal. Again, is to, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this later, right? Uh, we're going to need a sampling distribution for the data. We're actually going to need another distribution for the prior beliefs. And using these two, uh, you know, distributions, one for our prior beliefs, one for a sampling distribution for the data, we're going to be getting this sort of posterior distribution, which captures our belief on what the parameters would be like, right? Um, after, uh, after data is observed. It seems a little bit sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in different places for now, but we're going to connect these ingredients together. Okay. And the way that we're going to connect all of this together is using what we call Bayes' rule. Okay. And so Bayes' rule, it's really just this equation right here, right? I mean, there are multiple, uh, multiple forms of this. And I hope my uh, tablet here is working, so I'm going to give this a shot. And I'm going to see if I can annotate on these slides here. I believe I can. There we go. Okay. So what Bayes' rule is, is it gives you this sort of conditional probability. This is called the conditional probability of several events that can happen, right? So in this case, we have event A, right? And event B, so two different types of events. And so what we call this quantity right here is the conditional distribution or the conditional probability, right? Or the probability of A given that B has happened, okay? And so what Bayes' rule tells us is that, well, the probability of A happening given B happening can be broken down into this particular expression right here, okay? And so this quantity right here says, well, it's equal to the probability of B happening given A times the probability of A happening all over the probability of B happening, okay? Now, if you think a little bit about, you know, probability, this, this in some sense makes sense, right? So I can even just derive, you know, what this, you know, what this Bayes' rule is, right? Just from sort of a basic principles of probability, right? So, so in this case, P, the condition of distribution, uh, the conditional probability of A given B, right? Is given by, if you, you know, remember your, your uh, you know, probability 101 course, right? This is given by the probability of A and B, right? My apologies on my, my tablet is not responding that well. A and B over the probability of B, okay? And we're gonna deal with a simple you know, example of this later on. Now, this, this is the definition, right? Going from here to here. 
Now, if we take a look at this, all we have to then show is that this quantity on the numerator up here is just equal to this quantity. Okay? But the probability of two things happening, A and B, can you know conceptually be, be, be decomposed into the probability of one event happening, probability of A, times the probability of B given A, right? probability of B happening given that A has happened. Okay? So intuitively, this, this sort of decomposition makes sense. Okay? So this is, again, what we call Bayes' rule. And there's different forms of this uh, that we'll introduce later on. Uh, but this allows us essentially to go backwards, right? What we're essentially going to do later on is we're going to treat A as the parameters from our model. We're going to have B being the data. I, I'm introducing a bit of notation here, but this will make sense later on. Our data, right? these are parameters. Let me just write this here. Okay. And Y here is the data. Okay. And the goal is then to, you know, infer what the parameter, what the probability distribution of parameters are like, given we observe data, which is B. Okay. We're going to use this expression. So let me cancel this. Just realized I was annotating a part, like, I don't know what's going on with this one. Part of the annotation was on my slides and then part of it was on Zoom. Anyways, doesn't matter. All right, so let's take a simple example here just to sort of uh, cement this idea, okay? So it's a pretty sort of a, a, a standard example, right? You know, you wake up in the morning, right? Early morning, uh, for example, um, uh, as right now, and you take a look outside your window and it, it's cloudy, right? In, in whatever city you're living in. And you wonder, well, if I'm gonna go to work today, right? What's the probability of it raining? Because that will, you know, uh, that will sort of determine whether or not you should bring your umbrella to work or not. Okay. And so you want to sort of know what the probability of rain given it is cloudy today. Okay. And so in order to do this, I would need to, you know, know a few things about, you know, that the distributions here. Okay. So let's even just apply Bayes' rule. So in this case, rain itself is going to be our event A. Okay. I don't know if it's uh, even legible because I'm writing over something. Uh, but let me actually just go back here. Right, A given B. So in this case, rain is going to be event A and B is going to be whether or not it's cloudy or not. Okay. And by base rule, the decomposition that we need is going to be of this form. So the probability of it raining okay, times the probability of it being cloudy given that it rains all over the probability of it being cloudy. So that's what Bayes' rule says. So in order to calculate this probability, I would need to know all three of these ingredients. Okay, and that's what uh, I gave her here. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, nice transitions here. Right. So in this case, the probability of rain in city X is going to be zero point one. Okay. And the probability of it being a cloudy morning is 0 0.2. So what we're going to do is we're just going to integrate these ingredients right here. Right? So cloudy is going to be 0 0.2. Uh, probability of a raining is going to be 0 0.1. But we also need to know what the probability of it being cloudy is, given that it's a rainy day. So that's this quantity right here. Okay. So if it is a rainy day, then the probability of it being cloudy is going to be 0.4, right? So if we know all three of these ingredients, all we, uh, all we need to do is just plug this in, as I have on the next slide. Okay. And it turns out that once we crunch the numbers, then the probability of it raining 
given that it's a cloudy morning, is 0 0.2. Okay. And so uh, given that probability, then you have to sort of make a decision, right, on whether or not you have to bring an umbrella or not, right? Uh, but that's how Bayes' rule works, okay? Um, but we're going to then apply this thing to the problem of uh, parameter estimation in these sort of uh, these sort of uh, uh, heavy ion systems, okay? So let, let me just erase all of my scribbles here. Um, okay, I don't know why some of it is on the slide, some of it is on Zoom, but it's fine. All right, any questions on this so far? And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask um, on Zoom, on Slack, and I'm sure the teams will be happy to follow. All right, so the goal here is then to use this Bayes rule idea, right, to infer what the model parameters are from our observables, our data. Okay. So again, you know, if we take a look at our framework, this, this model parameter is going to be our A. These observables are going to be our B. Right. And what we're interested in is the following, right? The probability or the distribution or the density, right? It's really the same idea here. Um, of certain parameters conditional on observing data, right? So we can then you know go through with base rule, just write it out, right? In this case is going to be the probability of well, it's going to be reversed here on top, right? So probability of the data given the parameters, right, times probability of the parameters before we observe data, all over the probability of the data. And if you think about, you know, what we have here, this is really sort of underlying the sort of forward and inverse problem that we mentioned earlier, right? This quantity right here that we want, right, is the inverse problem, okay? Okay, I don't know why it's hard to make this inverse. Okay, inverse problem. But if you think about it, right, base rule gives us a way of connecting the inverse problem with the forward problem in the sense, right, that you know this quantity we're here, right, theta, the probability of data conditional on theta, on the model parameters, right. This is exactly that direction that we talked about earlier. If I go back a couple of slides. Right, it's this quantity, right? The probability of observing, you know, certain outputs, given I give you a set of model parameters. Right? So this quantity right here that I circled is going to be the four, quote unquote, the four problems, right? And so what I need here is both this quantity as well as this probability on the model parameters. So let me just go off uh, slides. Uh, project with jumping in the back here. Okay. okay. This is what we'll need, right? In order to apply Bayes' rule for this parameter estimation problem, we need, let me use a different color, we need this quantity, right? Which we're going to call the sampling distribution, right? Of uh, our observables, given we know uh, the model parameters, as well as this quantity right here, which we're going to call our prior. We're going to call this first quantity here the likelihood. Okay, two ingredients here. The likelihood, which quantifies the sampling distribution of the data, right? Or the probability distribution of the data, given we give it the model parameters. And then the second quantity here is the prior, right? Which quantifies our probability, or you can view this as prior belief, on the model parameters data before we observe any data from this, right? So going into the experiment, going to the Bayesian analysis, um, what we need is to have some way of quantifying what we believe to be, you know, uh, to be where that, 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 that parameter is going to be. Right? We need a distribution. And once we have these two ingredients, Bayes rule that will then give us a, a theoretical framework, right? For quantifying, right? For updating, we can do this, uh, our prior belief, given the prior and given the likelihood. Okay. So I'm gonna have to then figure out how to get rid of all of these scribbles from uh, my slides here. Give me one second. 
hopefully you can all see the screen here. I'm just gonna re-enter uh, full screen mode. Okay, so that's how we're going to apply Bayes rule. So this expression right here that I have um, right here, it's just essentially going to be base rule, just with different notation, right? What we're going to call um, this prior is we're going to have this thing be pi of theta, some function of theta, right? This thing right here is going to quantify our probability density, probability, probability density function, uh, which captures a prior belief on the theta. This is going to be a distribution, okay? And this f y can, uh, given theta is going to capture our probability of observing data y given model parameters data. And so this is then going to give us an update for what we call the posterior distribution, right? Which captures our posterior beliefs on theta given the data, right? So after we observe experimental data, how do we update our beliefs? Okay. And so there's actually this alternate form of Bayes rule and that we can easily work out from here to here. Right? So you can see, the numerator here stays the same, but the denominator here is then expanded into this integral expression right here. Okay. So let me just remove annotations, go to the next slide. Um, this quantity right here that we have on the bottom. Okay. And I'm going to again do some annotations. This quantity right here, remember it's f of one or the probability of the data, right? Is what we call the normalizing constant. Okay? You can view the normalizing constant, it's exactly what its name suggests, right? So in this case, we have some quantity right here, right? Keep in mind, this thing right here is going to be a probability distribution. So the top, you know, what we need to do to the top quantity right here, which depends on theta, is we have to normalize it. We have to make this integ uh, integrate to one, okay? And so this quantity right here is really, something that ensures that the top part right does indeed integrate to one right? so you can view that this top part right here will be some function of theta okay might look something like this right? whatever probability distribution but we have to make sure that this, this indeed integrates to one so it's a probability measure okay and this quantity right here will ensure that that is the case okay now this quantity right here you know really underlies one of the key challenges in Bayesian, uh, Bayesian sampling, right? Uh, you know, in order to you know learn what this distribution is, oftentimes we have to draw samples from this. Right? We have to have a way of drawing some some notion of probabilistic uh, samples from this posterior distribution. But in a lot of these applications, and we'll talk about this later on, we don't really know what this normalizing constant is. It's typically either not known or it's very expensive to compute, right? And so what we're going to need later on is a, a sampling algorithm, right? Which, you know, which in some sense bypasses the need to evaluate what this denominator is, okay? We're going to call this class of algorithms uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC type of algorithms. And so in bypassing this bottom quantity, right, this denominator right here, um, what we're essentially going to use is base rule in this particular form. This might look a little bit weird, right, but it's going to say exactly what's in this, uh, this expression, right? We're going to start off with the, the posterior that we want. And instead of an equal sum, right, what we're going to do is we're just going to just throw out this term. Okay, we're going to describe the distribution in terms of this proportionality sum. Okay, and so what we're going to say is that the posterior distribution that we're interested in, right, thing which captures our learning on the parameters, is given uh, proportionally as the product of two quantities, right? One is, again, the four problem quantity, which relates to how the data, right, uh, probability distribution of the data given the parameters times our prior belief on the parameters, okay? And we're just gonna use this proportionality sign, um, which is actually gonna be able, you know, we're gonna be able to use this later on in terms of uh, sampling what the posterior is gonna look like, okay? So all we need again are these two ingredients for the 
for the sample person. Okay. And this quantity again, yeah, this, this rule right here really nicely captures how we, you know, how we set our prior beliefs on the data and how we update our prior belief given the data that we observe. Right? This gives us an update rule for our belief, which captures our learning on the parameters. Any any questions on this so far? Yeah. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, feel free to you know uh, talk on Slack. Uh, but we're gonna move a little bit faster if this is uh if this sort of makes sense. So again, if you're you're unsure about anything, uh, just feel free to ask. Um, and I'd be happy to see. Good. There's no questions on Slack yet, Simon. Good. Yeah, I, I just took a quick glance at it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But you know, feel free to ask questions, right? Uh, of course, you know, this also keeps me on track. Uh, you know, keeps the TAs busy as well, right? But also, and most importantly, make sure that you're, um, you're, uh, you know, up to speed with some of the stuff. Okay. So the second part, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, this particular framework, but certain ingredients that we'll need to sample from this posterior distribution here. Okay. And so we're going to first start off with a simple, simple example, very simple example, just to you know get you sort of a, a, a comfortable with some of the um, some of uh, some of the the the, the, uh, the mechanics here. Okay. Then we're going to sort of make the problem a little bit more complex and introduce different ingredients that we'll need along the way. Okay. So let's take a look at a very uh, overly simple example, just you know, uh, just to sort of see what's going on. Let's say in this case. We observe you know, the observables, right? We observe the data, the, the, the data from our experiments come from the following probabilistic model, okay? We're gonna assume that in this case, we observe little n observables, okay? We're gonna denote them as y1 to y little n, okay? And we're gonna just say, look, what if these observables, and it, again, we're assuming that these observables are just scalars, right? So one observable observed um, n times randomly are going to come from this model right here. So again, remember theta here is our model parameters. So we're going to assume that we, you know, in some sense, directly observe the model parameters subject to some noise, okay? So again, in terms of the inverse problem, this quantity is going to look like this, right? This diagram over here. The noise we're going to assume is going to follow something quite simple, okay? Uh, this IID quantity, now for those of you that have not seen this, uh, is independently, identically, and independently distributed. Okay. And independently. Distribute. Okay. And so we're going to assume that each of the noise terms here are going to be distributed as such from a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution, right? With zero mean, right? This is the quantity for the mean, and a variance of sigma squared. Okay. So that's that's the assumption here. And you know, for the sake of the simplicity, we're going to assume that the sigma squared is also known, okay? So that's the model, okay? So from all of this, the question is then, well, how do I formulate my prior and my likelihood, right? Remember, we need those two ingredients uh, to start off the procedure for, base, uh, for the base rule. So one quantity that we can, you know, what, one easy prior distribution that we can have, right? Uh, if you think about it, right, in this case, we have a theta looking like this, and we have to start off by assigning like a prior belief distribution on this. Well, let's maybe just start off with something simple, which is, well, you know, before we observe data, let's say we have some prior knowledge, right, perhaps from prior studies, uh, from prior publications, uh, you know, that, that the, you know, what this true parameter is going to look like is it's going to be centered around some prior mean mu with some variance delta squared, okay? okay? So that's exactly what this thing here says, right? So the parameter itself, before we observe data, we're gonna have to place prior belief on this. And so let's take simple distribution here. Uh, if we have some sort of prior information that this is 
uh, you know, a prime mean of mu, this would be like 0 0.01 or something, right? Okay. And some par variance. Okay. We can then use this as our par distribution, which captures the par belief on theta. Okay. So let's say we take this particular ingredient here. Um, so in terms of that quantity, we have to then express this in terms of a probability distribution, right? A PDF, probability distribution function. So if we then go to our, you know, uh, our, uh, our, you know, our, our knowledge about the, the the normal distribution, right? And those of you that don't know this, you can take my word for it, okay? Uh, unless there's typos here, which I don't think, there, uh, but do let me know, okay? Um, then the distribution, p of theta, right? The probability density will take this particular form. And I, again, you notice here that I'm not writing out the full form, right? I'm giving this in terms of this proportionality part, right? So then if you know uh, the, the Gaussian uh, distribution, it's going to take this uh, exponential of this negative one over two delta squared times this quantity, okay? But again, I'm not introducing all of the constants here because actually, in the end, we don't really need constants. I'll show you why that's the case. Uh, this is essentially directly related to the fact that um, in Bayes' group, if I go up a little bit, right? We were dealing with this sort of proportionality, remember, this quantity over here. So that actually simplifies the, the computation and the, the derivations here. Okay. okay, so that's the part for the prior, like this quantity right here. But of course, we also need the second ingredient, which relates to, you know, what's the probability of observing a set of data points, y1 to yn, given we know the true parameter theta. Okay. But if you think about it, we actually know what this is already um, from this model that we just posited right here, right? Because if each of these were independently and identically distributed, then the probability of observing you know, a set of data points here, y1 to yn, right, is just equal to the product of the probability for each of the data points, right? And if we then work out, you know, uh, given that this is again uh, a normal distribution with zero mean and variance uh, sigma squared, we can actually just evaluate this expression. Again, I'm not going to go through the, the algebra here, right? But it's not hard to see that in this case, you know, again, getting rid of all of the constants right here with this proportionality, uh, our likelihood, right, the probability of observing a set of data points y1 to y and given theta, it's going to take this particular form. Okay? Exponential of negative one over two sigma squared, and then the sum of the squared term right here for each of the data points. Okay. Uh, any any questions on that so far? As, so you can see, we're going a little bit faster here. Uh, so there is a question on uh, on Slack, which um, already is receiving an answer right now, but maybe you also want to chime in. It is about sure. the sure. Uh, the knowledge yeah. uh, that we have about the prior. I don't know if you can re just read it by yourself. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Uh, so there's a question mm -hmm. on Slack, right? Which asks, um, do we, we often assume a uniform prior distribution. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just gonna finish reading. Uh, we can modify our prior distribution by theoretical knowledge, which is conservation and other physical uh, principles, for example. Uh, how does the prior distribution affect the posterior can give more detail? That's a great question. Um, so clearly in this case, um, I'm just talking about, uh, you know, if you have some way of setting this part, then this is how, you know, this, this update of your belief distribution uh, happens. But, you know, the, the, the question is, well, you know, how do we necessarily get this distribution, right? Uh, where can we draw our prior beliefs from? And so maybe let's take the, the simple case of, well, maybe we have a simple case where we know we have a certain parameter here, okay? And you know, physically, it can't really go beyond, let's say, certain lower and upper bounds A and B. Okay. Now, if we really don't have any information about this, you know, one perhaps reasonable prior distribution set is something which doesn't sort of give much information, right, about uh, the quantity A, uh, before, right? We don't want to bias our our learning procedure, so we might just set like a uniform distribution exactly like you said. However, you know, we might have other information, for example, from prior studies, perhaps from physical laws, right, or conservation and all of that stuff, which might guide 
a more informed uh, specification or elicitation, and we call that in statistics, elicitation of this par distribution. Okay. And so, you know, given these par studies or given this sort of information, we might set a distribution that looks something like this. Okay? Or maybe, you know, if there's sort of conflicting par studies, right? Then we might set a distribution that looks um, something like maybe one mode of this will be for this one study, right? And maybe another mode will be for this other study, and this is weighted somehow. Okay. And so, you know, setting this part distribution is a key part of this. And um, how this affects the posterior, uh, this does, of course, affect the posterior distribution, right? Um, because it, 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 it discusses, it, 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 you know, involves how we update this part distribution with the data. Okay. And so setting this part distribution is a, it's a, you know, it, it, it's an interesting topic, right? Which you, one really has to be careful about, right? And it should involve, you know, discussions with the physicists, uh, at least for me, right? The physicists that, you know, I'm working with and collaborating with to really make sure that I'm integrating what's in their head, right? Into that prior distribution that I run in terms of my Bayesian analysis. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so hopefully I answered your question there. Uh, if uh, you still have more questions, uh, feel free to ask on Slack. Okay, so let's take this simple example here, right? We have a prior distribution, we have our likelihood. And let's just go forward with this, okay? So what base rule says is it says, again, you know, um, let me just go back to my tablet right here. What base rule says is, you know, the posterior distribution of theta given the data that I observed from experiments. Again, we're gonna use the proportionality rule because uh, it's gonna be a little bit simpler to write out all of this stuff. It's gonna be pro proportional to the likelihood quantity, remember the probability of the data given the parameters times the prior that we assign on the data. Okay. And so both of these ingredients will come, uh, let's go up a little bit, from these two, these two things that we have. Okay. So you can imagine taking these two quantities and just multiplying them together. And you know, we're gonna have to do a little bit of algebra here, and I'm not gonna sort of up labor you. Uh, with all of these algebra early on in the morning. But uh, uh, you can take my word for it that in this case, you know, once we do a little bit of this algebra and we do a little bit of simplification, we actually get that this product can actually be massaged into this form right here, right? Which is the exponential of negative one over two. Again, there's a reason why I sort of wrote this in this form. Okay. We'll see a bit later on. But it can be massaged into this particular form where these parameters, uh, delta star and mu star, are sort of like updated means and variance parameters. Okay. Now, let's, I'm not going to sort of talk too much about this right now. I'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes. But that's one of the tricks behind sort of a Bayesian, Bayesian um, analysis is that, well, if we work out this expression, okay, and we know that this quantity right here is a distribution, right? This is a probability distribution. Then it actually suffices to be able to recognize like a distribution, which actually has this exact form, right? We can, you know, work from this proportionality form, get this, get this expression right here and think a little bit about, well, you know, is there a distribution? That actually gives us exactly this form when we remove all of the constants. Okay, and so you think a little bit about this, and you maybe just you know, uh, for for you know a bit of clues, right? You look back into the previous steps, right? You notice that again, a, a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution right here, gives something of this particular form, and this is exactly if you then you know take this expression right here and go to here, right? This is exactly that earlier form of the, the Gaussian or the normal distribution, except the parameters are updated, right? And so that's really the power of sort of this like proportionality. One of the, one of the nice things about this sort of proportionality sort of um, uh, notation is that what we can then claim is that, you know, because we recognize this distribution with these updated parameters, clear all of the annotations here, that, um, that this distribution, which is the posterior, 
right here. We can then claim that this is going to be normally distributed with new mean parameter mu star and new variance parameter delta star squared. Okay. That's that's sort of the idea. So the idea is that we can sort of work out this expression. And then in this very, very simple case, we can recognize that this expression right here that we get from taking the product of the uh, likelihood and the prior gives us exactly uh, the, 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 the important part, right? The kernel, right? Of uh, the Gaussian distribution, the normal distribution. And so we can then claim from here on that the posterior that we want from the, the, the model right here, right? Essentially gives us this sort of update rule for the posterior, which is still going to be normally distributed. Okay. And in fact, you know, if we take a look at this simple model, right? It gives us some really nice intuition on how we actually update our beliefs, okay? So let's just take a look at this sort of a uh, posterior mean, we call this, right? The mean of the posterior distribution. And let's just take a look at what, what's actually going on here. Well, if we take a look at this posterior mean, mu star, we can actually write this as uh, a weighted, right? Uh, linear combination of y bar and mu, okay? Where y bar right here, I don't think I explicitly defined this here, uh, y bar here um, is going to be the average of the data that we observe, right? So this is going to be one over n of the sum of y -ups. So essentially, we're taking the average of all of the data points, all of our, uh, the, the, the realizations of our observables, and then we're going to average them and right? get the average observable. So this sort of, you know, in some sense, captures quite intuitively our update rule, which is taking an average, a weighted average, of the, the data portion, right? Um, this is sort of like our data-driven average of what we'll estimate as, as, as data. But there's also another quantity, which is coming from the prior, right? This mu right here is the prior mean, right, of theta before we integrate any data on it, right? So this, this expression, right, just even in terms of the mean, gives us a, a glimpse of how we're actually updating our beliefs, right, uh, from our prior, from our data into our posterior, okay? And it's actually the same thing as a very nice interpretation for the variance as well, which I'm not going to discuss too much. Okay. So in other words, for this very simple example, okay, where uh, if we go up a little bit, we have our prior being a normal, more normally distributed, and our likelihood here uh, being just a normal noise. We're actually going to be able to get a very nice expression for what the posterior looks like as a distribution, right? And so from this quantity right here, right, since we know that this is a normal distribution with these model parameters, all we need to do is you know, go to your favorite uh, programming language, like R, uh, MATLAB, uh, Python, whatever, right? And just draw samples, right? Draw random samples from a normal distribution, and this will capture our posterior belief on theta. We can easily sample this in this very simple model for Bayesian parameter estimation, okay? Okay, so I know, uh, uh, you know, what we just talked about is a little bit technical here, right? Uh, but hopefully you sort of understand the general gist of this. Um, let me see, uh, there's a question on Zoom. Oh, it's a comment on Zoom, yes. Uh, so John mentioned that it's important to know, yes, so this is a, a, essentially what we call, a simple case, is what we call conjugacy, the fact that we're able to sort of recognize that distribution, right? Uh, and in most cases, right? And I'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. We're not gonna be able to recognize this distribution, okay? Uh, but in this simple case, we are, okay? So speaking of uh, more complex cases, let's uh, make the problem a little bit more difficult, okay? So let's take the same observation model, but let's try to make things a little bit more complicated, okay? 
So we're going to still observe the data in the following way. Okay. Uh, again, we're going to have uh, observations y1 to yn, right? Um, and we're going to observe this directly on the parameters itself with just some noise. Okay. So we're going to take the same likelihood part of things, the same data generating procedure, right? But we're going to let's let's consider a more general prior distribution. Okay? Remember, we talked about the setting about you know setting the prior from our prior information, right? Um, you know, and we talked about this idea of maybe we have certain conflicting studies, right? Maybe we have a uh, three or four studies which suggest that the true parameters are around this area, right? But we have this one other study which suggests that you know, this parameter is maybe a little bit larger. And so in order to capture both of these, uh, you know, opinions or both of these beliefs, right, um, from prior studies, we might want to use a distribution, which is not just a Gaussian distribution like this, right, but something that's a little bit more multimodal, right, has multiple peaks, maybe something like this, right? But of course that, you know, brings uh, an issue, which is, look, how does this then work for the posterior updates? Do we still get a very nice expression? Okay, we actually uh, clear a bit of the annotations here. And so we can go through the same procedure, right, with Bayes' rule. And we can write out, well, you know, um, pi of theta given y, right, is equal to um, okay, f of y given theta times this. Okay. So in this particular case, this quantity wouldn't change, right? But close up that, okay? But we're going to be using a more sophisticated, a more complex prior distribution right here, which is going to take this form. Okay. And that's challenge because, well, you know, if we actually work out, you know, a very complex expression. Uh, or more complex, more involved expression for the prior, right? And this, of course, proportional, uh, proportional to, then we might not even be able to recognize, right? If we work out the algebra, we might not be able to recognize a nice distribution at the end for our posterior. You know, that's sort of what we relied on earlier is being able to recognize that distribution, right? This notion of conjugacy that John mentioned in, in, in the chat, right? And so if we're not able to recognize that distribution, then of course the, 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 the limitation there is we're not necessarily able to sample from this. And so we're not able to characterize what we, we learned about the, the parameter, right? We have no closed form distribution that we can sample from, okay? So then the question is, well, okay, if we're not able to recognize the distribution and we're, we're in this more complex setting, then what do we do? We'll need sampling algorithms, right? Which can take this expression right here, right? And generate samples, probabilistic samples from this quantity, right? And so that's where we're going to introduce a little bit of, very briefly on what we call um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods or MCMC, okay? Uh, there's been a lot of developments, right? Uh, actually in the last, you know, in let's say 20, 30 years, right? Uh, from the Bayesian community, right? Uh, on this precise problem, which is, look, if I have a distribution where I only know, keep in mind, remember, we talked a little bit about this normalizing constant, right? So in, in essence, the true distribution is going to have this normalizing term of it, right? But we don't really know this term, right? And so uh, as we talked about, this term can be quite expensive to compute. And so, you know, oftentimes we're just left with this proportional form, okay? Where we know the density without, you know, the part that normalizes it to, to one, essentially. And so we're gonna have to rely on these, this class of Mark, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to be able to draw samples from distributions where we only know that top part. Okay? And that's, you know, motivated from a lot of these sort of Bayesian parameter estimation methods where, we can't recognize the distribution. We want to generate samples from it, right? Good, all right. So let me take a look if there's any questions. Um, okay, this is good. 
again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to uh, send a message on Slack or on Zoom or whatever. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, sorry. let's talk a little bit about a sim very simple form of this algorithm called the Metropolis Hastings. Uh, and then a little bit, I'll sort of draw it out before I sort of explain what the algorithm is. Talk a little bit about the history of this algorithm, actually. So Metropolis and Hastings is actually quite interesting. Um, Metropolis was the first person, and I think he was actually a physicist from uh, Los Alamos, right? Uh, I think in 1953, uh, where, you know, they were working on, you know, sampling algorithms uh, of this particular form. Actually, I think it was specifically related to Bayesian analysis, but rather it was more uh, an algorithm to perform uh, Monte Carlo simulations for uh, a complex sort of a physics problem. Okay? Um, and they developed, right, this, this uh, Metropolis algorithm. And it turns out that in the statistics community, right, around, uh, you know, uh, I think 1970 here in this case, okay, uh, you know, the statistics community was not familiar necessarily with this algorithm that was already published. Uh, and so it was sort of reinvented, right, in 1970 in the stats community uh, by Hastings. Okay? And so that's why, you know, this algorithm called Metropolis Hastings. Uh, it's an interesting sort of history here. But the algorithm is quite simple, okay? And so let me actually just share my screen uh, for the whiteboard, and I'll sort of explain what's going on here, okay? Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen uh, for the whiteboard. If not, uh, raise your hand and I'll uh, make sure that happens. So let's draw the distribution, okay? And remember in this case, we have the following, right? Pi of theta given y, that's the posterior. That's our likelihood. And this is our plot, okay? And so we're gonna work with this particular expression, okay? Which I'm just gonna maybe call this thing uh, just for simplicity sake, right? Uh, P of theta, okay? So this is the part that we can know from specifying both the prior and the light uh, And of course, this is not normalized and we don't have access to the normalization. Access. But one thing that we can do is draw this over the theta space, right? So, you know, we know P of theta. Maybe draw this distribution like this. Maybe it goes a little, up a little bit. And then goes back up. Okay. Uh, it's some distribution where we know this, but we want to generate samples. Right from this distribution. Okay. Um, and so what the Metropolis algorithm does is the following. We're going to first start off with an initial parameter, which we're, got, we're going to call uh, theta, let me see the notation, theta zero. Okay. We're going to start with just some initial estimate of the parameter, you know, starting over the parameter space with theta null. And what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate, right, uh, what we call an, uh, uh, an acceptance ratio. Actually, before we, we go into that, right, the idea here is as follows. So we start off with this theta naught, theta zero. We're going to try and generate proposals from theta naught, which would sort of navigate this sort of uh, distribution. So this is what we call a proposal distribution, okay? So I'm going to draw our proposal distribution in red. It might look something like this. Maybe we'll use like a normal distribution, right? Where our proposal, right? So our proposal is going to be maybe our next sample here, theta star. Well, in order to move around the parameter state, let's say we use a normal distribution which is centered on theta naught. But it has some sort of variance, gamma star, uh, gamma square. Okay. And so in this case, you know, the idea is to, you know, start off with theta naught and generate maybe a sample here, theta star, right? Which we're then going to assess whether or not um, theta star is a good sample to take as our next sample. Okay. So we again, the first step for Metropolis is going to generate a proposal from this proposal distribution. And then we're going to evaluate, right? Um, they, uh, you know, whether or not we should actually accept this new sample. And so if you think about, you know, what we should use for that, well, you know, 
one natural quantity to, to assess whether or not this is a good sample is to see what the value of P of theta is, right? P of theta star is. Right? So if you take a look at this, this thing right here is P of theta naught, right? This is the, you know, in some sense, capturing the probability density of our original sample, okay? And so we generate another sample here, theta star, okay? And as you can see here, right, P of theta star actually has a higher probability, higher density of happening than P of theta naught, our, our original prime. And so the question is, well, you know, we should be more inclined to accept this new parameter compared to the old one, okay? And so what we're gonna do uh, later on, I'll show later on, is we're gonna compute something called an acceptance ratio, okay? Which essentially takes the ratio of these two quantities right here, right? So I'm just gonna write down this expression. This is called our acceptance ratio. Okay. Acceptance probability. Uh, this is going to be taken as the minimum of one and p of theta star over p of theta naught. So, I mean, the intuition is as follows, right? If this P of theta star is larger, right, than the probability density of my original sample, then we take a look at this expression here, right? This will become one, okay? And so what that means is that with probability one, we're going to accept this new sample as our next sample from the, from the distribution. So our first sample will be theta naught. Our second sample will be theta one, which we then take. Right. as this new proposal distribution. Okay. This isn't the case where this quantity is larger than this quantity, okay? So let's take the other case where P of theta star is actually less than P of theta naught, okay? So maybe in this case, theta, theta star is gonna occur over here, right? And the probability of this is going to be less, right? In terms of the, the densities than what we started off with. Then the question is, well, you know, should we just not accept that sample or what should we do? Well, if we only accept samples that, you know, that increase in terms of the density, then you notice, well, we're not really going to be navigating the distribution itself, right? Because we're always trying to reach for the, for the, for the maximum of this sort of density. So we can't really set this as zero, meaning we can't really set the, the acceptance probability as zero. But what we can do is set this to be much less than one, okay? So again, what we're going to do if this, Theta star gives us a p that's less than our original, uh, our initial uh, density. What we're going to do is going to take a ratio of this, where you know if p uh, theta star is less than p of theta naught, then this is going to be less than one. Okay, and so what we're going to do in that setting is we're just going to flip a coin, right? With maybe in this case this would give us zero point four, right? Or zero point, and let's say zero point one. Okay, so we're going to flip a coin. Uh, a biased coin, which gives us heads with uh, 10% and tails with uh, 90%, okay? And if it shows up heads, we're going to take our new sample as the proposed one, if it's heads, right? Otherwise, we're going to take our next sample and we're just gonna repeat the original value, right? We're not going to move the sample. Here. So we're going to have a repeated sample. Okay. So let me actually just highlight um, the different cases here. Right? So this is the case where P of theta star, right? The earlier case where we always accept is that this is greater than or equal to P of theta naught. Okay. Then we're going to take this case. If on the other hand, our p of theta star is less than p of theta naught. Then we're going to, again, again, flip a coin, right? If 
you know, if it's heads, then we're going to accept that sample. If not, then we're going to repeat that original sample. Okay, I know there's a, a, a lot of uh, material. So any, any, any questions on this so far? I'm going to sort of, uh, you know, um, add in the full, full uh, algorithm a little bit later. Okay. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask us. Okay, so let me actually go back and share my screen for the PowerPoint, okay? So I'm not gonna go through the sort of technical, this is exactly what I just talked about. But now, right, what we can then get, and I'll, I'll just sort of show the MCMC procedure here, right? Is again, we start off with a certain parameter, theta naught. Okay? And so what this plot right here shows is how the sample then changes. Oh, by the way, I, I didn't, read, uh, I didn't, uh, say this about you know the earlier samples. I only talked about one iteration, right? Uh, but in practice, right, the MCMC algorithms, you're going to be repeating this procedure, right, until you get the amount of samples that you want. Okay, so you're going to be repeating this sort of proposal distribution, um, computing the acceptance ratio, and then seeing what sample you choose until you get maybe you know a thousand samples or ten thousand samples in your sample. So in this case, uh, what I plotted out here is what the samples would look like, right? Uh, theta of t over the number of iterations, number of samples that I have. Okay. And so the samples that are gonna be generated, it's called a, uh, it's gonna form a Markov chain, okay? Um, and so we're gonna start off with some sort of theta naught here initially, right? Theta zero. We're gonna run sampler in this case, you can see that, you know, it sort of navigates around, but the idea is that, you know, uh, and we can prove that this is the case, although I don't prove it here, that the samples that are generated, right, if we take this to t is equal to infinity, okay, then the resulting samples will converge to the distribution that we want, which is the posterior distribution, okay. Uh, so this indeed generates the sample chain that we, we want. Okay. okay. So that's sort of the idea here. Uh, now with MCMC, um, and I'm gonna wrap up my session now. I mean, so I'm going a little bit time in a couple of minutes here. Um, the thing with MCMC samples is that, you know, if you think about it, well, if I start off at a bad place, okay, let's say in this case, I don't start off where the distribution is. Let's say I start off with uh, a theta naught, which is a little bit far from the distribution, right? Then what the sampler is gonna do actually, it's gonna move around a little bit here, then it's going to move right back, ideally, to where the distribution is going to be, right? Uh, okay. So the idea, you know, of this uh, sample chain uh, moving back, even if I started off at a bad place, is called uh, the burning, right, of the sample. Okay, burning, burning in the sample. So the idea is that if we take a look at these samples, right, right off the bat, we can see that the samples here are unreliable. Okay, and so what this burden procedure does is it just says, look, these samples are not useful and I'm just going to get rid of them for the sake of my analysis, right? So we then set the burden here maybe as uh, 1000, okay? And then just use the samples from 1000 to 4000 as our actual samples. Okay. So what we got the burden period for MCMC. Yeah, so if the chain is uh, initialized poorly, we're gonna remove the first few iterations of the sampler and just use the later parts. Okay. And we can also thin the samples, although I'm not gonna talk a little bit too, uh, on this. Uh, I mean, we might wanna go over this a little bit later. Okay. okay. And so the goal after getting all of these samples is we can then, again, approximate what the posterior would look like, right? You know, perhaps by doing like histogram or something which which is based on the posterior samples that I drew after burning. Okay, so this gives us a way of sampling, uh, of querying our learning for the posterior distribution, even if we don't, even if the distribution is in a complex form. Okay. That's the idea behind MCMC. Good. All right. So let me just wrap up with this last uh, part. Um, of course, there is you know many other. Uh, this is just a very simple MCMC. Uh, procedure, right? An MCMC algorithm, and there are much more sophisticated samplers. Uh, I think one of them that's interesting is called the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, HMC, which actually uses a little bit of physics, right? 
uh, uses a, a Langevin dynamics uh, in order to. Um, oh, my camera just shut off. Yeah, which uses uh, Langevin dynamics to actually navigate uh, the posterior in a much quicker way, so you can get uh, better samples, right? Uh, with less iteration. So again, uh, there's an interesting reference here that you can take a look at. Um, there's also other types of sample procedure, and I really just going to talk a little bit about this sort of MC package in Python, which you guys will be using for the hands-on session. Okay. All right. So let me just wrap up with this uh, slide right here, which again, we're sort of building up in complexity, here, right? And so previously, you know, in our model, we assumed that we can observe the parameters theta in some sense directly, right? In the sense that the yi's, right, are based on this theta plus some sort of nodes, right? Now, of course, in practice, we still have to have the model going on that we don't necessarily observe the parameters directly, right? Uh, remember, in terms of that inverse problem and the Bohr problem, there is that model, right? And so we're going to try and capture the fact that we have a physical model, right? A, a, a theoretical model which captures the physics, right? By this eta of theta. Okay. And so what eta of theta is going to capture is that forward model type of phenomenon, right? Remember we had model going from this to observable. Okay. Observable here is going to be our eta of theta. So you can think about you know having a simulator for these sort of heavy on collisions, right? And having different parameterizations initially feeding this through your simulator and getting quantities at the end from your computer model, okay? And so what we're gonna presume is that the data that we observe, right, from the experiment, is gonna take this particular form, okay? Where I have observables is equal to what we observe from the computer code plus some sort of noise. So it's really the same model, except all I just replaced this with is instead of observing the parameters directly, I presume that in this case, it's being observed from the forward model of the computer simulation. Right? And so the goal is to then sort of work backwards and say, look, if I have a computer model, right, I observe certain observables from experiments, how do I go backwards in the computer model to infer what parameters are likely? So that's really the setup that we're going to work with later on, a more realistic type of Bayesian parameter estimation. Problem. Okay, so if we then sort of work from uh, the quantities that we have, right, uh, the light good, the power, all of that stuff. Okay. We can actually move forward with a lot of this uh, quantities, right? Um, and I'm sort of uh, going to speed through this a little bit uh, because I think I really will go through this a little bit later on. But if we then formulate, you know, what the prior, the prior really isn't affected by the fact that we have an eta of theta. Okay? Let's talk about a prior on the, the parameters. The likelihood right here, right? The only thing that changes about this is we just change the mean, right? We're going to assume that the mean of this distribution is going to be from what we get from the simulator, right? Which is the eta of theta, forward model. And then the MC, MC procedure will then proceed ex exactly as follows, right? Because all we need now is to take the product of this, okay? So in order to perform MCMC, what we're gonna do, and if we're doing with tropical state is we're gonna start off with some initial parameters, uh, theta, theta zero. We're gonna you know, compute what this P of uh, theta zero would look like right, from this expression. And you notice, in order to compute P of theta from this expression, I would need to go through one run of the forward model, meaning I have to start off with theta zero, then run it through my model, right? run it through my simulator, and then get an observation of eta of theta zero. Right? Then, you know, if I'm doing metropolis, then I have to sort of do one proposal of theta one, right? And then evaluate, again, through the forward model, what eta of theta one would look like. Okay. And I would repeat this procedure, right? Until I get enough samples to work with. But this procedure right here that I just outlined really outlines uh, what Irene's gonna talk about next, which is, look, uh, especially in our Jetscape type of analysis, right? The simulations, right? In order to sort of sufficiently code in the physics 
in this four waterfront parameters to observables, we might require maybe a thousand CPU hours just to start off with one parameter, run the computer code, right? From here to here, and then get the observables, get the outputs corresponding to that. And so that that you know that that is a that this, that this computational bottleneck is really what's gonna you know slow down a lot of the stuff because if you think about it, right? Every single sample that we're gonna get from MCMC, or these are MCMC samples, right? Every sample that we're going to get here, we have to evaluate the the fit right of this particular sample, and that involves running a forward run of our simulator. If each run takes a thousand CPU hours, then how many samples can I really afford in practice, right? And the amount of samples that you collect, right? Well, uh, the more samples you get, uh, the more precise your uh, you know your learning is on in terms of your posterior, right? Um, so we want more samples, but each sample can be very expensive. So that's the problem that Irene's going to talk about a little bit later. Okay. Um, so, okay. So the idea is that well, the computer model here is embedded within the MCMs. This is fine if the simulator is quick to run, right? But especially in our jet skip depth analysis, right? You know, uh, a four model can take maybe a thousand CPU hours, right, or something like that. Very expensive. And so if we're going to pay a cost of a thousand CPU hours for every sample. MCMC would take a very long you know, time to run because each evaluation requires one simulation. And so Irene's going to talk a little bit, I'm going to hand it over to Irene soon, uh, about model emulation, which is a way of using predictive models in order to speed up. So what we're going to do later on is we're going to build a predictive model, which can, you know, I'm going to replace this with an eta hat, right? A prediction of um of what this simulator is going to look like from data and we're going to then plug in this eta hat within our mcmc okay? uh, replace this with the emulator to speed up the mcmc procedure okay all right great so uh, thanks again uh everyone um again if you have any questions uh feel free to just uh send a ping on slack and uh without further ado uh irene uh why don't you share your screen and then uh, you can take over Thank you. All right, so we go directly to Irene. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, uh, thanks, Simon, for introducing the first two sections. So for now, I, I'm just talking about uh, the computer emulation part. Oh, okay. Um, um, so this section will consist of uh, three subsections. First part is the model emulation using Gaussian process. Um, and then uh, I will talk about one uh, useful component in a JetScape analysis, which is the principal component analysis. This is useful when uh, we are dealing with multiple correlated observables. And lastly, it's just a quick overview of the full uh, Bayesian inference workflow. <laughs> okay, um, so as Sam just mentioned, one way to speed up the computer simulations and also to speed up the MCMC procedure is to do a uh, model emulation. So the idea is we first run a few simulations at um, some different parameter sets, uh, like we have uh, three sets of parameters, theta one to theta three. Um, we use um statistical model as uh, some uh, something called Gaussian process to train a predictive model using such simulation data. So this curve and uh, the band will be our uh, model. So once we have this model, we can use this model to predict the simulation outputs at any new set of parameters. Um, that's for theta nu. Okay, um, so in order to train this predictive model, we have to uh, prepare some training data. Um, this is the simulation data. It contains uh, both the input parameters, uh, theta one, two, three, and the simulation observables. Um, here, I'm just assuming there's a scalar observable, just one observable. So it should be eta, one, eta theta 1, eta theta 2, and eta theta 3. And we are assuming uh, the simulations is expensive. And yes, it's expensive uh, in practice. OK, so the objective is to build a predictive model um, which can predict new uh, simulation outputs, eta theta nu. <laughs> 
Um, so this allow, uh, we also want to quantify the uncertainty of this prediction um, at this point. Let me see if there's anything on chat. Okay, sorry, just a minute. This one is brief. Okay, um, so now um, we consider uh, this, uh, we uh, first apply a prior stochastic process to our simulator which captures our prior beliefs on the unknown simulation outputs. So uh, these are just some random draws from our prior stochastic process. So before observing any data, any of these curves might be the truth. Um, so the next step will be to conditioning on the observed simulation data, maybe some points here, here, here. We can obtain the posterior process of uh, eta given the data. And then we will use that model to do predictions or so-called emulation. <coughs> so in order to do so, we have to assign a prior. Um, a commonly used prior is called a Gaussian process. So this is a flexible Bayesian non-parametric model, which is widely used in machine learning and some other engineering fields. Okay. Uh, so the Gaussian process will have two ingredients. Um, so the uh, a general expression of Gaussian process is as follows, uh, GP, uh, mu, and K. So the mu here is the mean function, and K here is the covariance function. Let's just look at some visualizations. Okay, so coming back to our random draws. Uh, so these curves are our random draws from the, of the function. Um, so this mu, uh, this mu, the mean function um, actually specifies the uh, center location of all these curves. So that's the horizontal line. And second, this covariance function. Um, so suppose we have two uh, parameters, uh, theta one, uh, theta two. So the obser observables can be somewhere here, here, or here, here. So the correlations between these two observables. Uh, we control the smoothness of the function. So together uh, with the mean function, covariance function, we fully specify a Gaussian process prior. Mm, any questions so far? Okay, let me just continue. <laughs> okay, so now uh, once we have our um, prior process, which is the Gaussian process, we now use the data to update our prior belief. Um, so this is a figure showing we have a zero mean uh, Gaussian process um, and its uncertainty uh, for now is just constant. Uh, we also have one, two, three, four, five, five points coming from the simulator. So we want to use these five points to update our prior belief as follows. Um, so updates our uh, prior belief with point one, uh, point three, five, four, two. Okay, so after uh, we con uh, conditioning on our simulator and uh, given our prior, we can now obtain our posterior process given the data. <laughs> so it has the um, one uh, pink curve, uh, which is the predictive mean. And also we have this uh, light pink band. This uh, specifies the predictive uncertainty. So once we have this model, we can use it to do our prediction. And the prediction will contain uh, both the predictive mean and the uncertainty. So the advantage of using Gaussian processes here, we have both uh, closed forms for both uh, posterior predictive mean and the uncertainty. Um, so you don't have to memorize this, uh, this formula here. Okay, so for Gaussian process, as you know, um, there are two ingredients. So the key, uh, step here is to uh, decide uh, what's the main function you want to use and what's the covariance function you want to use. Mm, a very commonly used mean function is the constant mean. Um, so if you don't know anything about the process, you may just assume to be a constant mean and then use the co uh, correlation uh, covariance function to control the smoothness of the curve. Um, there are also some popular correlation functions or so-called co covariance functions. Um, one is the squared exponential correlation. This one is very commonly used. There are also some other correlation functions such as maternal kernel uh, cubic correlation functions. 
So we will go over uh, the GP fitting in hands-on session using a package called GPI uh, in Python. Uh, so any questions so far? Let me just check the time. Okay. Okay, so once we have this emulator, uh, we can consider integrating this emulator for parameter estimation. So this part is just to um, speed up the MCMC procedure and speed up the simulation procedure. Um, so this is the posterior distribution, uh, our target posterior distribution uh, from the last section, as Sam mentioned. Um, ADA here is the expensive simulator output. So because of <clears throat> this, uh, because the simulator is very expensive, we want to replace it with our uh, predictive uh, distribution, the emulator, eta hat. So that's how we replace it. But um, one thing to take note is, as you see in our uh, the previous visualizations, our predictive uh, function will always have uncertainty. So the emulator is not uh, deterministic. So we have to in, uh, consider the uncertainty in this posterior sampling. This is, uh, we use uh, S squared to denote the uh, predictive uncertainty. And then we just integrate the uncertainty within this likelihood. Uh, okay, so uh, this part is the likelihood and this part is the prior. So the way we integrate this uncertainty within the likelihood is to replace the, um, the variance parameter by the sum of both uh, experimental variance, uh, experimental uncertainty, and predictive uncertainty. Um, so whenever we have a sigma squared before, uh, we replace it by sigma star squared. Okay, mm, so now we can use this modified posterior, which integrates this emulator and emulator uncertainty within our MCMC sampling. Um, so the way to do so is to replace uh, the target posterior by this approximated target posterior. So this allows us to have a uh, efficient parameter, uh, parameter estimation for expensive parameter models. Um, any question for the model emulation part? Okay, so we go on to the next subsection. Um, so the second thing we want to discuss is the principal component ana analysis. So the reason we want to discuss this is because um, in JetScape, there are usually multiple observables and a lot of observables are quite correlated. Uh, so how do we model um, this correlated observables jointly is a problem. Um, so there are a lot of uh, ways to do in statistics. One way uh, we choose to do is to use dimension reduction, um, which converts uh, the n correlated observables to k independent outputs. And this symbol just means k is much smaller than m. And then we just use the k components, k outputs, uh, to do some uh, emulation and some other tasks. <coughs> um, so the way to do so is to do um, principal component analysis. Um, so PCA uh, actually finds directions with maximum variance uh, and project data onto these directions. Um, the reason why this is useful because the maximum the variance contain uh, a lot of information of the data. So we want to uh, find directions with maximum variance where the parameters have the most impact on. <coughs> okay, so as the name suggests, uh, principal component analysis. The key here is the principal components. Um, These pieces are just a few linearly uncorrelated coordinates. So if you look at this figure, um, uh, this is uh, x-axis and y-axis are the original axis. And uh, these two, two black arrows are our linearly uncorrelated coordinates. So PC is uh, a linear transformation of observables onto uh, some other uh, coordinates. So the first coordinates, the first PC has the highest projected variance. So in this figure, it would be uh, this direction. Um, and the second PC is perpendicular or orthogonal to the first PC 
and has the second highest project, uh, projected variance, which is this direction. Okay, um, any questions so far? If not, let's look at a simple example. Um, so here we use uh, uh, the, the iris data sets to, to show a visualization of the PCA. Um, this iris data set contains 150 data points. Uh, each point is an iris flower. Uh, so each point has four observables, uh, four measurements of the each flower. So there are this uh, length and width observables. Um, so these three flowers can be classified into three groups um, depending on their uh, types of iris flowers. And um, here's just a visualization of the four observables. So we do see um, high correlation between some observables, uh, like these two are always just uh, pos positively correlated. So the question is, can we somehow reduce the dimensions of the observables to a smaller number, meaning a one or two, just smaller than four? Um, so that's, uh, so how, uh, how we reduce the dimension is we do PCA. Um, so this is an output from uh, some uh, software and uh, it, 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 this table, let's just focus on the last line. The last line is called cumulative proportion. So it means um, how much of the variance is explained by uh, the first one, two, three, four uh, principal components. So uh, from this table, we can see the first two pieces explain 95.81% of the total variance, which is a lot. The last two just explain less than 4%. So we, we may decide to just keep uh, principal components one and two and remove the last two. This uh, will be our uh, reduced subspace. Um, so instead of using four um, uh, observables, we now only have two PCs, PC1 and PC2. Um, if we do the projections of the data points onto these two directions, um, we can see uh, there are three, uh, there are still these uh, three groups. And the key here is the first two pieces conveys not almost all information contained in the data. So we can use them for further analysis, such as uh, regression, classification, emulation, et cetera. Uh, any questions? Okay, um, then just some uh, technical, not so detailed, so technical introduction for PCA. Um, just the workflow for PCA. So it starts from a data matrix containing N data points and N observables. So N will be a large number. Um, and then after doing some scaling uh, standardization, we compute the covariance matrix of all these data points. Um, and this part is just uh, what's being done in the uh, in functions, uh, the Python fun functions. So you don't really need to care about this. It's, uh, so it first does this eigen decomposition to decompose this covariance function, and then choose the first k um, pieces, uh, first the first k components to do the linear transformation. So this is the linear transformation we perform. Um, so this allows us to go from uh, M observables to K principal components. So the data, uh, the dimension of the data matrix has reduced. Um, yeah, so it reduced dimensions of observables from M to K. Um, and then we train GP on the PCs, which are now independent. Um, so they are not correlated anymore. Okay, um, any question for the principal component analysis before I go to the last section? Okay, um, so if not, let's just uh, take a look at the workflow for Bayesian inference. Um, so we start from, again, the data matrix, uh, a large data matrix, matrix where M is a large number. The first step is to do a uh, data dimension reduction via PCA. So we use PCA to uh, obtain this K, uh, M by K dimensional uh, data matrix. And the second step is to train uh, a Gaussian process on each of these independent principal components. Um, so this is the interpolation step using a GP. Uh, third step, reconstruct observables. 
So because we say this piece here is a linear transformation of the data, we can always ha uh, have a way to uh, do inverse transformation, inverse transformation, which transforms back to the original parameter space. And then we can use uh, this predictions to do uh, MCMC sampling to obtain the posterior distribution. <laughs> so that's the workflow uh, of the Bayesian inference. And um, this is a figure showing the posterior distribution of some selected parameters in a recent JetScape study. Uh, so the paper, the link to the paper is here. Um, yep. So any questions for the last section or for all the slides we've gone over just now? There isn't a question on Slack right now. Okay. But uh, uh, participants, please ask questions. Do you have any? Yeah, uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, if you have to, because uh, we're going to be doing like a hands on session where you guys will be, you know, following this uh, um, the, this procedure, right? Step by step. So, um, you know, if you have any questions, comments, uh, um, you know, uncertainties, right, about some of these, uh, these, uh, the, the sort of pipeline, uh, feel free to ask so that, you know, the hands on session will be uh, more clear later. Okay. At this point, you can probably just unmute and ask the question if that's possible. <laughs> okay, maybe we uh, should have the break before the hands-on okay. session. If there are no questions now, we can... Um, Maybe uh, take some questions at the beginning of the hands-on session, since I think we have some extra time. Mm -hmm. Stop early. Does it make sense for everybody? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. So the uh, we're supposed to reconvene at um, eleven East Coast time. Um, should we um, should we start a little bit early, like um, ten fifty? Yeah, I think that would be good because the hands-on session is actually a little bit longer. Okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe we can start up at uh, yeah, a little bit earlier. That would be good. Ten ten forty five or ten fifty. Ten forty five. I think would be good. Yes. Okay. Everybody... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then let's reconvene at ten forty five. <laughs>